Yeah, so what I, what I want to talk about today, uh, well, first I suppose I should say thank you for coming on a Friday uh, evening and afternoon uh, at the end of term, uh, which I'm sure is not you know, a great time, but um, thank you for coming anyway. Um, what I want to do is what, as uh, classical liberals or libertarians, we should be doing to implement the change that we want to see. Um, and first I thought it would be a good idea to sort of set the stage from a sort of libertarian perspective. There's very good news at the moment and very bad news at the moment. Uh, the bad news is, is that government's growing and they're uh, spending money to an absurd degree. They're not actually cutting very much. The regulations are still strangling businesses. Uh, there's crisis in the Eurozone. Uh, the Liberal Democrat Party isn't really very liberal anymore. Uh, and we have a foreign policy which is overstretched and costing us money. Uh, so not the most classical liberal libertarian world to be living in at the moment uh, by any measurement. Um, but there is good news, uh, which I think is that... Well, there is obviously a crisis going on in the Eurozone, that, uh, and also the crisis that started in 2008 with the clash of Lehman Brothers. We've actually seen a sort of resurgence in classical interest in classical liberal ideas and libertarianism, which I think is a good thing. There were two libertarians on Question Time a couple of weeks ago, which is unheard of. So Daniel Hannan, uh, conservative MEP and the founder of Wikipedia, who's a confessed Randian, so it's quite nice to have. Uh, we have uh, think tanks like the one I work for, the BIA, uh, Taxpayers Alliance, the Adam Smith Institute, and others who are getting uh, more attention in a good, in a good way. Uh, my boss, Mark Littlewood, was recently appointed as an independent uh, 10 Downing Street advisor, which is a you know, move in the right direction. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if he's listened to that. Uh, I, you know, I'm curious to see what the outcome of that is. Uh, libertarian books and films are selling very well. Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged has apparently in the last two years skyrocketed on Amazon, which is, a, which is good news. Uh, Although I must, I'm not a Randian myself, but I think you know she, she's better, better to have allies and enemies in the libertarian world. Uh, the new road to serfdom and the road to serfdom are all doing very, very well. Uh, there are more student groups, and we had, I don't know how many of you knew, but there was a rally against debt as sort of trying to kickstart something like the Tea Party movement in America, which started. Um, so despite the bad news from a liberal perspective, there are still you know, silver linings in the cloud. Uh, and what I want to say, I suppose, my the brunt of this is going to be, I think there are five ways that you can really implement change if you want to. If, if you're someone who thinks, well, I have an idea about how I want the world to be, how should I go about doing this? So you can do the political thing, you can run for office, you can try and be a member of parliament or a local councillor or whatever you want. <clears throat> you can do one version of the think tank thing, which is to go into micro-politics, which is to sort of change things bit by bit by implementing policies that governments will listen to and ministers will listen to. You could try and become a media figure, you could try and become a prominent novelist or artist or journalist or pundit of that sort, or you could establish a policy group or think tank where you always say what you believe and try and get it out there as much as you can, or you can do what I think is the right way to do, which is to create a sort of counterculture or social entrepreneurial space where you can develop change. And I really think the last two, always say what you believe and be a social entrepreneur, are the best ways to do it. Uh, now, before getting on to why I think that, I think I'll dismiss the first three one by one. Okay, so why, why we shouldn't be in politics? Okay? I don't think uh, libertarians in this country or classical liberals don't fit very well into three major parties, at least to say. Uh, the Tories in Thatcherism came quite close to a lot of it, but they were still quite socially authoritarian. Um, a bit of that still lingers. I think the Liberal Democrats like the Tories, actually, I think the Liberal Democrats do have a libertarian wing. Um, and it's a small wing, maybe a feather on a wing, but it's still there. Uh, and it, it's small. The Liberal Democrats have a worrying tendency, I think, at the moment, to be more of a social democratic party. They're moving. I think in the last election, this is especially evident as a lot of people who voted for them thought of them left of Labour on some issues, which is, well, mistaken, considering they've had 75% of their manifesto implemented with 9% of MPs, which is better than the Tories. Uh, but there are backbenchers who I think are quite libertarian in those two parties. I won't talk about Labour for uh, obvious reasons. Um, but then there's also UKIP, which calls itself a libertarian party uh, on its website, uh, which I think it's fair to say it's really a one-issue party at the moment. It's a Eurosceptic uh, nation-state nation party with some very, very illiberal, non-libertarian immigration policies. So while a lot of people in UKIP are libertarians or call themselves that, I really don't think it's the way to go. 
Now there was uh, recently, I, I don't know how many of you were ever members or knew of the party, the Libertarian Party of the United Kingdom, which, uh, I think this, this is recorded, uh, but I think it was actually a bit of a, an embarrassment and a bit, they, it didn't achieve what it wanted to and internally. I think Libertarians are quite anti-club to begin with, very individual and they don't like to be in political parties, uh, really. And I think that uh, in the, the main reason why we shouldn't be involved in politics is that you've got to make friends with the wrong sort of people to implement libertarian change. There's a huge public choice problem in, in politics or any electoral system where there's going to be a concentrated benefit for a dispersed amount of cost, and this is where lobby groups come in and just muck up the whole thing. To become, as a, as a backbencher, you have very, very little influence on anything, really. Uh, ministers have all the oomph, and to become a minister, you've got to be loyal to the party whip-wise for sometimes a matter of decades, by which time God knows what's happened to you in the meantime. So, step one, yeah, don't be a politician. This is my, my first step. And that's not to say that there aren't talented people who should pursue this. I think if you want to uh, see it in your lifetime, you should not be pursuing it that way. Then there's this, um, what I said earlier, which is what some think tanks are going on about, uh, which is the sort of the step-by-step -step approach. And this is actually, was advocated, I suppose, most <coughs> famously by um, a very, very left-wing group, the Fabians, whose uh, strategy is to eventually achieve socialism through step-by-step -step implementation. <coughs> um, on the more libertarian side, uh, Mass Imperial of the Adam Smith Institute has advocated this, uh, this way of doing things. And I think to a certain extent, both of these can claim an ex uh, some sort of success. You have the Fabians and the Adam Smith. I think both of those think tanks or policy groups have actually made, uh, have achieved some of the changes they wanted to. Uh, the problem with this step is, I think, you have to be academically rigorous and ready. At all. You have to have 100% academic credibility. Uh, and you have to have it on a wide range of policies and have them ready for whenever there's a crash or a civic, you know, huge shift in public policy. Uh, and that, that's challenging. Um, and it's also an unfortunate position to hold because you're unlikely to ever see the changes that you ever want. Sort of like politics, you're unlikely to ever really see this happening. Uh, but the advantage is, is that it turns out uh, that ministers and civil servants quite like these people. Because what it means is that they know who to turn to whenever there's a crisis or a sudden change in a shift in policy and they have a ready-made policy to implement or suggest to the government and they can deflect responsibility back to whoever formulated it. So it's, it's good in that sense, but for the other reasons I mentioned, I wouldn't advocate it um, as the first port of call. Uh, as I mentioned, also you could become some sort of political figure. So, and this, this has uh, similar problems uh, with the political one, which is A, very competitive, B, very, very, you have to make, know the right people and make them like you, and you've got to have a certain sort of personality. Uh, from the journalist side, you have, in this country, City AM, which is probably the country's only uh, explicitly Austrian classically liberal newspaper in America, you have reason. Uh, Fox Business, which has libertarians like Andrew Napolitano and John Stossel, who are watched by a healthy number of people. Uh, over in this country, I guess you could say, while well, I did just dismiss UKIP and the Tories as not very um, explicitly, you have uh, Daniel Hannon, who I just mentioned, who's quite uh, obviously a politician, but very popular um, publicly. He's written books, he features heavily on radio. Uh, and Nigel Farage, who I think actually, while well, obviously being the leader of UKIP, um, is on the more libertarian wing of his party and does get a lot of media attention. But as I said, you know, I think this requires a huge amount of tenacity and dedication to do, and a lot of people that set out to do it are, uh, like politics, the number of people who want to get into it and then succeed at it is a, is a small percentage of the people that do. So, that's what not to do, um, in my opinion. What we should be doing, um, what I wanted to start with is uh, give a little plug, obviously, to where I work, the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, which is, I think, a, an approach that's worked is just actually saying what we believe in a long-term, uh, gradual uh, approach. Uh, Hayek, uh, when he advised Fisher, who founded the IEA, Fisher apparently, as the story goes, went up to Hayek and said, well, I'm thinking of running for parliament, or thinking of getting into politics, and Hayek was dismissive of this, sort of as I was, saying, no, what you've got to do is influence the public and then the politicians will follow. And I think that's right. Um, well, the problem with this, though, I, I don't think this, this approach isn't without its problems. I think there is a problem of holding a minority opinion and banging on for it for as long as you can and being known for only that. And I think this is um, what a lot of think tanks and policy groups can do this sometimes. Uh, and actually, there's, there's a problem which 
is called, Steve Davies told me about this, uh, and I forget the sociologist's name, but came up with the cultic media problem, which is if you continue to advocate and just press on one particular issue, you are going to be grouped with people who do similar things. And unfortunately, a lot of these people are not people we would like to be associated with. I'm talking about, you know, the 9-11 truthers, the Freemason group, the, the conspiracy theorists. And it's unfortunate, especially from a libertarian perspective, how many people can be put into this category, um, especially in the Austrian school for what particular reason. I suppose it has to do with holding a minority opinion that this can happen. Uh, so I think that's not to dismiss the, the approach, but just to be wary that if you want to have a career where you're just going to bang on about one thing continually. And it can be a broad thing, like the IEA as well, free market advocacy is what, what's done. Uh, but what's definitely needed is you need to have, like the step-by-step, -step, you need to have very strong academic credentials. You've got to know what you're talking about when people ask you questions. And you have to have a public appeal, which will help you get away from the sort of cultic media problem. You've got to be able to appeal to a broad range of people. If you are not interested in persuading people that you're correct, then there are obviously libertarian clubs and book clubs and things to hang around in, and that's fun to do, and I, I do it. But I think if you want to appeal to the public, you've got to um, be publicly presentable. And also, crucially, you have to have good relationships with the people that matter, so i.e. the politicians and the journalists, which is another reason why you don't want to be associated with some of these the cultic media problems. Now, I, I thought I would do a bit of a plug of where I think this is needed, and I think there's a gap in the market for um, two policy areas that don't have a dedicated libertarian free market classical liberal approach in Westminster that's speaking to the politicians. I think the number one thing is drugs which uh, has to be, I think the war on drugs has to single-handedly be the stupidest policy any government could decide to pursue. And if I had my, if I was, if there was a policy think tank politics genie that popped up and said, Do, you can change any policy, I would end the drug war immediately overnight and uh, move all currently prohibited substances into a legal market. But the problem is, is I don't think that there is an effective lobby for this at the moment, despite the fact that I think that the public is on board with a lot of liberalization of uh, drug policy. And I think also it's a good way to get people who are socially, uh, sorry, who are economically left-wing on board, actually. I find, you know, a lot of the people who call themselves up and are very sympathetic to at least liberalizing laws about marijuana and for at least decriminalizing some drugs or for lessening the amount that we punish them, uh, punish people who partake. And I think it really is uh, a gap in the market. Uh, obviously, people like this who want to pursue a free market think tank drug uh, could become a bit too isolated, but I really think there's a gap in the market here. Also, um, immigration. I brought along Becker's book, Challenge of Immigration, which is an interesting proposal. Uh, but I don't think there's enough dedication um, as far as a policy group goes towards actual, you know, what is a sensible immigration policy. The number of students who study here is going to increase. The number of immigrants who come here is going to increase. The population of the world is going to increase. And the, the, you know, the British people and British government have got to come up with a solution to the fact that there are going to be more foreigners coming here. Um, my, own, my own opinion is that I think uh, this was advocated in America. I think any student that studies here should be granted permanent right to stay or perhaps a green card in America or whatever. I think it's, you know, if we invest as much into educating them, we want them to stay here. Uh, so that would be my solution to it. If you come from a foreign country, I'd rather you stay here than go back and where you're from. That's the nationalist in me coming out. Uh, but my own opinion. Now, my favorite uh, advocacy um, is going to be for social entrepreneurship, which is to develop communities and develop uh, societies where your outlook becomes popular without government support. Uh, this is the sort of left-wing examples of this, like the labor movement, for example, and the environmental movements are particular social entrepreneurial sort of uh, things that have taken off. Uh, and the, the advantage to this is you can advocate for change that would never be popular in politics. So for example, I'll take one policy, uh, well I'll take a few, but I think one that really comes to mind is education. Which is a lot of people don't seem to realize, that, and, and I didn't know this until recently really, but that the UK have some of the most liberal homeschooling laws in the country, in, in the world, sorry. That it, even more so than America, which is where homeschooling is very big, and there are homeschooling communities. And the, I think technology is really going to make good education at home much more popular. There's something in America called Khan Academy, which was a uh, financial advisor, was asked by his cousins, or nieces, I think, to tutor them in calculus. And he started making YouTube videos and built software to do this. And it's now used by thousands and thousands of students all across the country. 
but and and it, you know the, the grades are going up. He's very good at teaching math to thousands and you know potentially hundreds of thousands of children. Problem is, is that math teachers don't particularly like this for obvious reasons. The teachers unions don't particularly like this, and people that fund state education don't particularly like this. But you don't need to get that support to make this thing popular. If there are results and you can homeschool and you can get private entrepreneurship to develop these results, then I really think uh, this is something that needs to be pursued. And in America, there's a, a, a sort of fascinating uh, phenomenon, which is of uh, homeschooling communities where the kids uh, socialize with one another and the parents um, consult with one another on the different textbooks and the different methods. And I think that's really something that needs to get uh, developed a lot further. Uh, another idea would be uh, welfare. I think you could do this through uh, in a certain way. Obviously, there's a giant government monopoly on the welfare system in this country, but I think uh, why not start with the redevelopment or making popular again things like uh, friendly societies. Um, I don't know if you know um, Anton Howe's Liberty League. Yeah, uh, and, yeah he's uh, doing work on this at the moment on how we could actually get a social entrepreneurial welfare system that provides benefits, life insurance, other sorts of things. And I think that would work quite well. Law and order is another area I think this could be implemented. Um, mutual protection agencies, neighborhood watch. It's still legal in this country, although apparently it's only been done four times in the past century to privately prosecute people, which is a perfectly legal, privatized way to do things in this country, still on the books. Um, and I think that'd be quite a cool thing to bring back into vogue, if we could, um, through social entrepreneurship. Then there's obviously private security, um, which I think is, you probably do need some sort of support to do this, um, to sort of replace any sort of police force. Uh, local communities, local towns uh, could be able to do this, but I think it really is something worth doing. And the biggest, the biggest one, uh, not for my emotive poll, but that's obviously the biggest policy issue, is I think health. Because uh, we have the national religion of the NHS, but I think actually uh, the development of technology and communication, you can get developed specialized clinics. Um, I actually think hospitals aren't that very good of a social institution. You have a giant, giant building full of very, very sick people all in one place. It's not very productive. It's economically wasteful. Uh, this, there are examples of this uh, in places like Utah and Arizona, where people live in very isolated areas where they have developed clinics, and depending on what your ailment is, they either come to you or you come to them, and it's of quite a cheap cost. And I think this isn't something, again, that would require government sanction, like anything I've mentioned here. You could try and start it up yourself if you can get a developed community going. And this is only really possible. I think the rise of uh, social networking and social media will make the development of these communities a lot easier. Uh, now, you can take these two to silly extremes. Um, well, they call them, I, I think they're quite sensible, but there are silly extremes to this. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Free State Project in America, which is, there was a libertarian PhD student at Yale who wrote a paper saying, why don't we get 20,000 libertarian-minded people to promise to move to a small state and we will implement libertarian activism. And they developed this online and they picked New Hampshire and there's something called the Free State Project and uh, 15, I think five, between five and 10,000 people have pledged to move to New Hampshire within five years. Uh, there's already a community of 2,000 people living there. And it's not just you live, you move there to New Hampshire, uh, but you become a libertarian activist. And they have people elected to the state representative party, uh, government, uh, implementing. And they have activists from the gun laws to medical marijuana to, I mean, all sorts. The, New Hampshire was picked because it's a very small state with a low population, so you can make a big dent in uh, local policy. I don't know really what the New Hampshire residents think of this, or these sort of out-of-staters <laughs> coming in, um, implementing, but it does, it, it, it started off because New Hampshire has uh, no sales, <coughs> like very low income tax, very liberal gun laws, and it was rated by the Mercator Center at George Mason as the freest of the 50 states in the Union for social and economic, uh, followed closely by South Dakota. Um, then there's another extreme, uh, one of my, my heroes, uh, Milton Friedman, was obviously a Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, huge advocate of liberty. His son, David Friedman, is an anarcho-capitalist who specializes in privatization of law and legal systems. And it, you know, it seems like it gets nuttier, but his son, Patrick Friedman, uh, started something called the Seasteading Institute, uh, which is a think tank based in California. And their goal is to make uh, floating cities or countries, essentially, where people, and where you can experiment laboratorily, uh, have, you can, why not have political experiments? Because it's very hard to innovate in politics, for example. Um, the United States has had a constitution around for you know, hundreds of years, uh, and there's been, you know, there have been a few changes, but there's, it's very difficult to have good innovation uh, in political systems. So uh, Patrick seems to think that 
if we had floating cities or floating islands, we'd be able to, and anyone can move, it wouldn't have to be a libertarian thing, it could be if communists wanted to come and start their own thing, they could start their own thing. Um, and funnily enough, there is a lot of legal grey area, uh, and the reason the high seas is useful, because I think it's 15 miles out, international law is a bit hazy, actually, isn't it? It's far from obvious what the... And so I think Patry said, we'll start with cruise ships, and then I think by 2040 we'll have some sort of floating city slash island is the, the long-term goal. There's, uh, I think, a, an example of how this might work legally is there was a Dutch ship that went around South America, two countries where abortion is illegal, and picked up women uh, and then performed abortions on the ships 60 miles out were perfectly legal, so they couldn't be prosecuted back in their own country. So 50 miles out, I, you know, you can be experimental with laws and legal systems, uh, and I think that's a good way to go. So, yeah, I've spoken on what I think we shouldn't be doing and what we should be doing. Uh, floating countries, this way to do it. Um, but more seriously, step by step, uh, community social entrepreneurship, and yeah, and the drug war. That's. Uh, I think I'll you know pause there and take some questions, but if there are any, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank sure, you. But, you um, know, does what? anyone have any questions? Who wants to start? Cool. Sure. Um, it's just you put a lot of focus on libertarianism, and I agree with most of that. It's just there seems to be a neglect of egalitarian issues, and whether that was just obviously you didn't have time to speak to people to a libertarian society, but right. to have that as the sole focus, sort of, in my opinion, sort of just makes it seem. Like right. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, I'm a free market libertarian, that was the, the brief I sort of had. Um, but uh, as far as being egalitarian, um, I, I think I think equality is an overrated virtue. I don't think it particularly matters morally. I could imagine uh, a world we might prefer to live in where people are more unequal. If you know, one percent of people were billionaires and the rest of us were millionaires, I would be a much yeah, exactly. more unequal Sorry, so society. And I think, you know, so I'm, if, if, if you mean equality legally... Or I should mean um, equality of opportunity. So, the obvious, the obvious example is just underdevelopment in other countries. It's how, right. how, how do you get that focus onto redistribution to these people? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I think for, for developing countries, there are ways to, to do this. Um, there was an uh, economist at Stanford called Roman, what's his first name? Paul Roman who's um, developed this idea of charter cities for the, the developing world, which has actually been taken quite seriously by um, uh, countries in South, South, South America and parts of Africa, where a way to ensure um, development in sort of this social entrepreneurial way would be that there would be a city in a particular country that you could pick, and it would be exempt from whatever laws, and people would have freedom of movement, and people would be able to <coughs> experiment with laws and regulations that would help. And if you had cities in a particular developed country that had different legal systems and different economic systems, mm -hmm. the country as a whole would hopefully develop through competition and you figure out what the best sort of systems would be to help people develop. And Just sort of on that point, it's because um, that is one possible solution mm -hmm. to the problem, but you did use the word hopefully it isn't the idea as well that some people have an abundance of resources where other people need that those resources. So it, is, it isn't that sort of focus sure. that besides liberalising these laws to actually engage with people who are not doing their moral duty. Um, yeah. Oh, well, if, if you believe in moral duties, you can say that. I, but I, I won't advocate the theft of people's property to help other people as much as I even think. Even if that people. theft, even if those property that property was undeserved in the first place? Well, I, I don't know who I would trust to make that judgement of it being undeserved. I would say it was undeserved for you to, to have that laptop if you stole it, but I don't think it would be, it would be fair for anyone to say you should should force you to give it to someone who doesn't have one because you might have been born into a richer society where people have nice things like laptops and university educations and things like that. I think you do have a moral, you probably should, you know, consider giving some of your property away to people less fortunate than you through no fault of their own and I try to do that as much as I can and I think that's, you know, and I look down on people who don't but I don't think I, I individually, you know, my libertarian, I individually have no right to force you to do that. So no, uh, Bill Gates goes good on a man's pledge to give away what, 98% of his wealth by the time he dies, and that's a great thing for him to do, and I think it's obviously the right thing for him to do, but I don't think anyone has a right to force him to do it. He could have, if he wanted to, have, in his will, said, well, everyone, I buy everyone in the world, you know, 40 hamburgers, which he could buy. I mean, it's, it's up to him. He is an exception, then, because you, you do that a lot of people who don't feel it's their moral duty. That's true, and I, I can't force people to change their mind on what their moral duty is. I, 
I mean, he did actually manage to get a fair few number of billionaires to sign on to this uh, promise. What was it? Um, so I, I think that if you have an objective belief in everyone does have a moral duty to do this, and it's the government's role to enforce a moral duty, that does worry me. I don't think it's the enforce. I think it's the social enterprise, the sort of uh, means to actually encourage and provide for them where it's easy. And you know where you're going to it, it's, not, it's not hard for rich people to give away that money now. Does it change the mentality? Yeah, yeah, and I think change of mentality would be, so I think a lot of, um, I don't know if any of you have seen this Nick Robinson documentary that's going on the BBC at the moment, uh, but he did one uh, yesterday on taxation and how much the rich pay in tax and all this sort of thing. And he was interviewing the founder of um, Phones for You, who is worth a bit over a billion pounds. And they calculate that he will, in his lifetime, likely contribute about 280 million pounds to tax. And he was being interviewed saying that he greatly resents, oh, sorry, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he doesn't feel good about paying tax, and he wish he didn't have to do as much of it. Because he has so many private uh, charities that he gives to, that he knows where the money's going. And I think the good thing about social entrepreneurship, like charter cities or, develop, or investing in private companies in developing countries, is people would have more of an incentive to do that because they would know where it's going. And the resources would be allocated as per, um, and I, you know, the, the rich do give a healthy amount to charity, but I think a lot of them are discouraged too because they are paying sometimes literally, you know, ten times fortunes <laughs> to taxes where, frankly, you know, we have an education system that's shameful, we have a health care system that doesn't really work, our roads are... I mean, the fact that <laughs> you're not seeing great results for the amount of stuff you're putting into it. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, my typical libertarian thing will be, yeah, lower the taxes and encourage private investment and get social... Improvement. But I think that I, I think it is a huge problem for libertarians to... Um, answer this, well, you can never, in a perfect libertarian world, if someone was as rich as Bill Gates and decided to leave it all to his two children, that would be perfectly fine. And, you know, some people, I, I have a moral sort of twinge that I think, well, you know, maybe he should have done. Mm -hmm. But I have no moral right, I don't think, to say, we well, must. Um, and I don't want to live in a world where that happens. Um, you mentioned just something that you're, you're perfect libertarian world. What? Would that actually entail? What, 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 it sounds a bit fairy when I say it like that. But um, well, I mean, what um, are there any major policies other than um, the legalisation of drugs that you would make sure are there, or other ones that would be, or anything like that? Right. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think. Uh, well, in a, so if I was going to colonise Mars, for example, yeah. I said, right. So what do I want to happen? That's uh, a bit different to. Like currently, um, this one may be unpopular in some libertarian circles, but I think a, an army is not really the end of the world. Though we, you know, I am uncomfortable with some countries in the world having nuclear weapons, and I think you know we need to have. Uh, I think the government has a role uh, handling diplomacy. If if, we, if you're going to have nations, which is another thing, if I'm going to colonize Mars, would I have flags and borders and these sort of things? So, I mean, probably not. But I think the government has a legitimate role to do that. Um, I'd have some sort of state to enforce contracts and to make sure that fraud was stopped. I'd have, um, I don't know. I think, well, anyone who's going to colonize Mars is going to be quite wealthy. And obviously the, the, the crux of the libertarian issue is what we've just talked about, which is what are you going to do about the less fortunate. Uh, and, you know, people who describe themselves as libertarians advocate things like the negative income tax or whatever to have some sort of safety net, uh, which I think I would advocate in a sort of practical policy world. But no, if I you know, found a Pacific island or a, another planet, I, I would really make sure there was some... I don't even think it would have to necessarily be democratic, really. Um, I'm not sure even I would want the government to be involved in making the laws, but I'd want there to be some sort of ultimate authority on judging if a contract's been violated or a wrong's been done. And I think that that's an unhealthy thing to leave to the uh, majority, really. So I'm not against laws. I don't think government's particularly good at making them, but I'm fine for them as a sort of principle, for example. Anybody else? I mean, I'm obviously willing to talk about, you know, like, <coughs> my drug thing, um, or the immigration thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's actually good. Yes? Just an idea for this social enterprise, <coughs> what, what sort of, um, what sort of form will it? Um, <clears throat> well, really, I, I, there's, a, there's actually a good bit of variety that they can take. So they have to be physical communities, for example. Like what I, what I explained with 
Khan Academy in America, like math teaching through the international Skype. I mean, that could you could potentially. It's not impossible to imagine that every <coughs> child in America or Britain is taught by you know twenty math teachers. This is possible, right? Um, so it doesn't have to be a physical community for things like law and order. Uh, I imagine you would probably need a collected physical. Um, so you would have a concerned set of citizens, or who are obviously rich enough for have the same sort of drive to say, well, why don't we? organize our own security for this street or this neighborhood or this town and you, that would, you would develop that way. Uh, welfare, I think, like, like I was talking about these friendly society things, they're, they're not physically grounded. Um, and actually, going back to um, Patrick Friedman's seasteading idea, his, his mandatory thing, I, I think he said this, is that people need to have freedom to leap and to experiment and that his ultimate goal is that everyone would be able to sort of detach themselves and float to whatever other country they want and experiment with their laws and you would have, so I think, uh, I think really as long as people have freedom of movement and freedom to innovate, that it could be a physical or non-physical community. This is why you have so many libertarians who work at Google and other software places. Uh, like Patrick Freeman used to work at Google or whoever. Um, PayPal, I mean, Peter Thiel, who was the angel investor on Facebook, he's an ardent libertarian. Uh, the founder of Wikipedia is a Randian libertarian. He had Pearl Trees. Of what, sorry? Pearl Trees. Pearl Trees. No, it was like a website that um, it's sort of like a, a visual mind map thing. So you right. you sort of create a pearl, and then you have a sub like pearl, and in that pearl, then you have like a little. You it's initially meant to link to articles, so you can sort of organise it a lot better. Oh right. And so I, depending on your particular interests or yeah, that, yeah, okay. And you can look, you can look at other people's pearls. They just say you can have a look at um, someone who's interested in the European Union. Load of articles of it. And I, was, um, I sort of proposed because I worked with the student for sensible drug policy as well. So oh, all right, okay, cool. So I proposed to them the idea of sort of doing a sort of education and sort of narrative thing through this um, format. And yeah. Would that be something that you could sort of take to the next level in a sense? Because once you've got like, yeah, no, sure. a big mind map, that's sort of. That sounds like a perfect idea. I mean, that's sort of what I visualise it being in that everyone, like, and it sounds like a perfect way to get people with the same. Uh, uh, no, that sounds perfect. Sounds something that I would certainly be a fan of. I'll check that out. Um, I'm, I'm quite curious. What, what is the sensible drug policy at um, the moment? At the moment, they well, the founder of it sort of links to Transform. Right. So yeah. And I, they've got this big framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tra Transform are an interesting uh, group. Um, yeah. I think it, I I don't know any of the people who work there personally. I, I've seen. Uh, their senior policy advisor speak before. I think um, they're obviously not ideologically back. Like they, I think they have quite right-wing people and quite left-wing people working there. Their goal is well, get uh, drugs decriminalised. I think is Transform's main thing, uh, or in a regulated market as quickly as possible. Um, and obviously, you could you could do that in a communist state, and you could do it in a libertarian one. Um, so that's what slightly my my pitch was. Why isn't there a sort of a liberal? based on, well, if we're going to believe in individual freedoms and liberties, using that background, why don't we advocate for the legalization of drugs or the decriminalization and have it, you know, uh, not necessarily Westminster based, but Westminster, you know, focused. Because you could obviously do a huge campaign to educate people, um, but that's, that's my opinion. I, I should, you know, big fan of Transform, but I'm glad that there, yeah. And then them as well, I've got a campaign thing. What was yeah. that? Is that just evidence-based? Yeah, well, you know what annoys me about this? Um, <laughs> sort of, Because at conference there was, um, for those who don't, there was a, pol a motion put forward that was voted on and passed, which was that the Lib Dems should consider uh, evidence-based uh, policies for the decriminalization or, or you know, a, a more sensible drug policy, like mm -hmm. you said. Um, the problem is, is that then the Liberal Democrats have ministers and MPs who will advocate for, you know, illiberal policies of which there's very little evidence <laughs> that, that there's any change. So people like we should, you know, the ban with airbrushing on, you know, advertising posters or, you know, with smoking ban in cars or well the smoking ban period. Um, the what has the word isn't that the harm principle on that point, isn't that the harm principle? That, that, that if you're smoking in a car over okay, the law does say the, the new law would not allow you to smoke in a car even if there wasn't a child present even though it was presented with that clause. No, well, I, I don't think, 
I, well, A, I think the evidence on this cost working thing is, is hazy at best, really. And then I also think, well, yes, the harm principle, if we're going to apply it, we should also be applying it to the drugs as well. Because e even if you advocate for the decriminalization, legalization of drugs, you've got to accept that they are dangerous things. Right? I'm perfectly with Like that marijuana will do things to your brain. But I wouldn't right? accept that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're intrinsically dangerous because we've, we've, only, we've only ever been able to test it. Okay, they're right. intrinsically, but they're not normal for humans. In this, in, in this social environment, but as we create new social environments, and the, the yeah, effects can be channeled in one of the Yeah, but it's physically so, so there's a difference with what you know, negative effects. That's so I, I'm not going to make a moral judgment on what the effects of marijuana or heroin do to you are, but I, we yeah. can accept that are effects that are from the norm. Okay, fine. Now, you can make a moral judgment on the bad effects for you um, medically, which I think is, yeah, heroin is not good for your health, right? Should we, I know this is maybe controversial, but um, <laughs> that, that heroin is probably not that, that good for you. Um, so, but whether it, it even is like uh, socially beneficial or negligible, I, I think I don't particularly care. I mean, okay, if it's, if it's going to do good things for you, that's great, then why isn't it legal already? If it does bad things, then that's regrettable, but we have alcohol and cigarettes perfectly fine, so why not have these? Um, I think the argument against the alcohol and cigarettes that they're already integrated into society, so We've to learn to manage them. But they weren't always. Like tobacco is a relatively recent thing for Western civilization. I mean, coffee is a relatively recent thing for Western, and these have become perfectly integrated. Alcohol is old, and that's a naturally occurring thing. Um, so it's just got to be a balance of when it's the right time to. Of course, but I think actually the, the time is right at the moment because the, 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 the public, I think, um, and also it, the public is on board with a lot of this, and I do think there are communities where legalization would work better than others. So. I, I can imagine there are parts of this community where if you legalized, you know, pot tomorrow, there'd be very little difference in the behavior of a lot of people there. It would, I mean, there are, and then there are some communities where things might change slightly and some where people wouldn't change their behavior at all. This is why I advocate for this sort of, you know, sort of like experiment with whatever these, the best policies are. Because um, it's going to be very, very tough to get the politicians to legalize this stuff, I think. Um, and obviously, but, you know, any sort of social pressure or social change or if local communities have the legal power, which they don't. This is why America is slightly better, because you have states that can delegate and you can experiment. Um, over here it's a bit harder. But I think as long as you localize it as much as possible, where there can be as much experimentation as possible with different policies, then that's better than trying to get re-elected than sitting on a back bench for years and then trying to propose a motion and then try, you know, I mean, it's tricky. It just appears that this transform has provided a framework if the drug policy motion is to have any effect socially, that sort of framework needs to be sort of marketed yeah, sure. Um, once there is that safeguard and everyone in society recognizes that it, that it's going to have a chance of actually getting in. No, I, I do think that's, that's probably true that um, if there is ever a, a serious bill in Parliament or uh, that's proposing legal, the, the, the communication side has got to be very strong and the marketing is going to have to be there. But I, I, I don't think that it's as big an issue as people think. I don't think there would be a huge amount of there would be opposition to it, I, I guarantee, but I don't think it's as much as people think there is, really. Well, not, not, not the Matthew Feeney bill, right? That, that would get a lot of opposition. But the sort of, we should decriminalize marijuana. I really don't find this having a huge amount of public outrage or anything about that. I mean, my thing where you should be able to go to Booth and buy crystal meth, I mean, that's a very different, you know, sort of proposal. <laughs> and I understand that I am, I am in the minority on that, on that opinion. But my, the, the deregulation or de decriminalization of marijuana has got to be not that difficult a case to make in public, really. And it's, yeah. I, I, so, no, transform, obviously, all right, you need a, a community wherein mm -hmm. it's already going to be accepted. Because I always envision, like, the sort of um, Amsterdam sort mm. of coffee shop system whereby not only that, you could sort of include the education process in that, so people yes, don't want to just sure. sit around and just smoke a split, for example, they want to actually be engaged, because it doesn't necessarily have these erratic effects that people say, it's just, no, of course not. I, I, I can work and smoke marijuana at the same time without having any that, like any ridiculous um, effects about it. So. Right. No, that's that's um, obviously I, I I would agree. And there are, you know, there there are social policies that we have been implemented in the past that probably that would never have passed democratically, but I think would good as well. Like uh, the abolition of slavery comes to mind. Probably you know quite a good thing, but you know wouldn't have passed any sort of real democratic popular. 
Um, and you know, I'm not a huge fan of democracy, really. I think you know, capital punishment in this country would probably be reinstituted if it was given to a popular general vote. So would I mean, the immigration policy that if, if the British general public had a general vote or poll on what they want their immigration policy to be, it would be miles away from what I think would be the best one. Uh, so no. Are you putting education at the sort of crux of this argument? Yeah, no, I think education is, is important. So that's why democracy isn't good, because people aren't educated. So no, no, it's not. It's not really. I, I think democracy is just an inefficient way of doing it. That's politically, uh, democracies are inefficient at implementing change. That's what I was saying. Uh, democ I mean, education is an important part of getting a sensible drug policy implemented. But I, I think, uh, so the example like like that you said that you you said you know use of marijuana doesn't affect you know you perhaps as it does a lot of other people. And this isn't actually just a case for marijuana. That uh, and I think it is a point that needs to be made more, which is. You can be a casual user of uh, crack cocaine and heroin. I met these people myself. I mean, but, well, not for for research, not. Um, but um, <laughs> point being that um, there are uh, this this uh, drug psychiatrist who specialises in addiction therapy was talking about a woman he met who casually takes heroin and cocaine uh, did for about a year, once or twice a week, but then she got pregnant and walked in and said, "Well, you know, I don't think I need therapy because I'm just going to stop," and she just cold turkey stopped. And you know, some people can do this for very addictive drugs, and then there are some people who are hooked off to the first hit. And but but now, you know, the analogy is that there are alcoholics, for example, there are people who are going to abuse this stuff. But the edu I agree that that point's not really made enough. I'm just a bit confused about your against democracy point. I just I just think well, it's just mob rule and grossly inefficient. In what sense? Well, in that you could have 51% of people deciding on a policy that would harm the 49%, and I think that's unfair. But if, the, but if the whole population was at the same level of education, and then, it, and that, and then the political process... I mean, yeah, okay, you could have 51% of people that would be fair. vote to... That would be fair. Okay, yeah, you could have 51% um, of... You could have a population of perfectly educated people who have the same ideas, and you could still have 51% of people vote on a policy that would really, really harm the 49% that's left. Not difficult to imagine, really. Um, that's... Uh, as in, there's always, um, this is the sort of taxation and theft point again, which is that the, if... The current system doesn't exactly lead to fair outcomes. No, yeah. it is. And we live in a democracy, fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not, I mean, it's not a direct democracy. No. no of course it's not. But, I mean, we, we haven't had a direct democracy in use in this country or ever, really. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if we're going to have one, I, I, I would quite, as, you know, if we're going to have a democracy, a direct democracy would probably be the way to get it, but uh, as a political system, it ain't all that to shout about. I mean, it, it's, you know, that famous Winston Churchill quote that it's the best of the worst, sort of, what did he, I forget the exact words, but Winston Churchill made this point that uh, without any alternative, democracy is the best of the worst political systems. Um, and I think that's probably true. Yeah, I'd rather live here than in North Korea, right? <laughs> point. Okay, yeah, um, and I'll take, I'll t and I appreciate the fact that I have a voice in uh, what little chance I have, but that you don't need a democracy for that. And, and in this country, the number of people that actually will implement change electorally is is nothing. So what sort of system would you advocate? But just um, private contractual arrangements between individuals. I, I really don't think you would need so much. For, for, for the larger projects, for the um, sort of you know, mass security, international, you don't see any bigger bodies. Oh yeah, sure. You could... Um, the bigger bodies, so you could have the direct democracy of people whose job is just to handle diplomacy and the legal systems, and that, that I'm fine for. Yeah, okay, so if we're going to have that, but if you had a legal framework by which any elected body would only be able to tinker with you know, certain treaties and certain laws, that's fine. It's when it gets into well, special interest groups and all that sort of thing that I start to get very worried. Uh, but you know, with the technology we have nowadays, something like what the ancient Greeks had is perfectly conceivable, where you know, even a farmer could walk into the forum and cast a vote. I think that's you know, it, it is possible to create. <clears throat> so if we if we did Patrick Friedman's idea and we had a, a floating a cruise ship and everyone could vote, you could have well, if you're over the age of eighteen, you get to vote on every single bill or law that's proposed, and you know that is perfectly doable. Um, obviously, there's always there's, like any electoral system, there's a chance of fraud. Sorry. Sorry, you think that system would be inefficient? It, it would. It would. It's still a democracy, but it'd be more efficient than any democracy in the world today. Yeah. Is it? Well, Switzerland have quite good things like cantons. Uh, you know, where there's direct democracy, where 
Um, but even even in a direct democracy system, it's not all that to shout, shout about. And like I said before, I, in, in this country, and well, America especially, this is really, the, the number of people that actually implement change democratically is nothing. Uh, like in 2000, George W. Bush became president on the back of literally a couple hundred votes, was it? Or a bit over a thousand? I mean, it was not, they decided the election. In, uh, in Alabama, if you're a Democrat, your vote just does not count. <laughs> you are more likely to die on the way to go vote than implement any change. You're statistically more likely to, uh, there is no way in which. So in, in any upcoming American election, the, it's the voters of four or five predictable states that ever have any chance of really making a difference. And it's the same in this country. I mean, 90% of seats, over 90% of seats in this country are safe. You know, you could, you could attach a you know, blue rosette to a corpse and it would still win a lot of these things. I mean, it's, sorry. And then just in terms, because obviously you're speaking to like libertarian groups, right. like, just in terms of making it have more sort of uh, wider appeal, mm. how a lot of the, um, you yeah. don't have a problem with uh, people making a lot of money. Uh, no. But a lot of people would, um, a lot of people would. Yeah, say, no, sure. Yeah. How, how, because of the position of unfair uh, mm -hmm. initial, mm -hmm. How would you sort of encourage them to not let this situation occur? Not let the situation occur by which? Because uh, the way that I see it is that it's the demand for this financial, these financial products which generate income for these financial services. Mm -hmm. So surely the answer is for people to stop putting their money in these accounts where they're earning risk, where they're earning interest, balance against risk. So. I mean, the old yeah, but there's where you didn't earn interest, could that not be a sort of alternative whereby people could know that their money was safe? But yeah, okay, fine, yeah. Um, sorry, I just, let me just add that, and then adding the whole managing of risk on a sort of, in a democratic way, so that the, the actual risk factors, for example, volatility in some oil rich country, that it's only the people who are. That are, beside, that are behind the curtains doing these deals, gold and that, all these bits that are actually, that are actually um, making, that are actually understanding this risk. And so if this risk became a democratic process, so as a nation, people right. were understanding the risk that their country had because of the relations, could, would that not be a worthwhile project? Uh, probably not. I mean, I, no, I don't, well, well, how do you democratise the risk? I don't, I'm a bit confused. So, so, so if you, you in terms of understanding the risk, we pay financial services right. for their expertise to yeah. manage our risk. Right. But that's therefore I don't think that people can hold financial services as responsible for the crash because no, I, I don't. Yeah. Not. No. Yeah. Not. But um, so surely the answer is to educate the people who are going to put their money into these accounts on the risks. So right, but I, I don't think. I think you're underestimating the, the intelligence of most people. I think most people do, when they're shopping around for what bank account do I want and what interest and what investment should I have, I think most people do, you know, research this. Mm -hmm. And I, I, no, I think, I think people do, you know, they're not yeah, completely blind. You still don't know about what, what influences market on No, sure, but if, if you want to start a bank which is, look, I promise this will just be a vault. Right, mm -hmm. and that you won't earn any interest on your money. You could never uh, say that because why not? You could because because the value of every asset is always changing. No, but I mean, not 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 even an investment or asset the base. You could just have a, a bank, and its only job is to hold people's money, and you promise not to have money. Any money is an asset. So if money is an asset. The, the 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 value of your money is dependent is uh, dependent on the value of the goods and the value of the what people in America hold of that currency. So even if you hold your money in a, in a bank, it's, that value isn't going to remain there. It's just, it's, it's going to be continuing. So the point is to not... Yeah, but that's going to be true in whatever financial system you have. If you have, if yeah. you have a currency-based uh, banking system, there's going to be fluctuations exactly. in the value so of the currency. My point is so to educate everyone on these risks, on these fluctuations, rather than leaving it solely to... But, but who, well, who's going to volunteer to educate all these people, and who do you trust to do the education? Um, I don't. The Khan Institute, the, the Khan Academy. No, the Khan Academy, yeah, but that's. But what I mean, I think, you know, Khan Academy is obviously doing a good job at educating people just because of the results. Then you can measure what these kids are getting on their standardized tests, and they are a definite improvement. But I can't think of a single person I would trust to educate everyone on 
on what the on you know the financial services and what's been going on uh, with all the, 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 the amount. If, I, if I get taught, and what people then would change their behaviour. Like if, if Goldman Sachs knew that there was somebody going around the country educating people on what the what the assets were being used for, people would change their behaviour. But if, if I get taught here at university about, about all this and I've learned through my through being on the BBC to bring their bodies, right. then that the reason I do that is because I have the incentive because I'm gonna get a degree out of it, because I have the time because I'm a student but, 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 it was but, you, but, you, but you have a different incentive to someone else. Like I don't do those things. I don't check I don't have investments in Certain things, and you know, I have I have a bank account, but I don't use it for investments or whatever. I mean, so you and I might have different incentives, and no one who's going to do this mass education is going to know what everyone's incentives are because we have different things. Like, I, I have money for a different reason than you, I and mean, we have different priorities. I, you know, I want to save up for different things than you. There is some problem with that. There is. Some. Okay, we both are going to buy food. I guarantee you tomorrow, right? Okay, fine. But, and you spit up the leisure. You spit up. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but some people value leisure more than others. There are some people who don't go on holidays and don't splurge out, but that's not because they can't afford to. There's a bunch of you know, very unimaginative rich people, for example, who do just you know, not do very much. And I think if I had that money, I would have a lot more fun than you do, because you're a bit miserable. But you know, that's the point is... is <laughs> that's yeah, just I, your definition of leisure. Yeah. But I can only ever have my own definition of leisure. But you, but you, can't, but you can't say that you have more leisure. You have yeah, okay, on, on, my, on my own basis, which is the only one I can ever have, I think I have more leisure than this person. Oh, that. That's so you are like, No, no, I have I just said on, on my own value, of, right, right. on my own definition, which okay. is the only one I can ever have. I mean, I'll leave it up to you to decide if I'm right or not on your okay. measurement of leisure. But, okay. but that, that's exactly my point. This is always going to be a subjective thing on whether people... Like, there are some people who value food much more than others. Like, I quite like food, but there are some people, like people, colleagues I work with, or friends I have... Food is like, yeah, but exactly right. And some people don't think that. Some people think of food as a bit of a necessary curse and spend less money on it. And, you know, I, I just don't think that you could ever get anybody that, or at least that I would trust, to go around educating people on the happenings of these financial services. Because all that needs to happen is they get bored out. If you have Goldman Sachs and all these people who, you know, and they know there's a government-ordained spokesperson for what Goldman Sachs are going to do, these people are going to get lobbied and bribed through the fact, I mean, as, as happens already in the U.S. Treasury, which is pretty much a Goldman Sachs club, ah, really. So, so your point is that it's not that people can't learn, it's just that they provide false information. People can learn independently what these financial services are doing, but I don't trust the government to teach me to, to, what's going it's on. Not an argument for complete transparency. Uh, yeah, no, I'm a big transparency fan. So well, for, for uh, in government, yeah, I think you know Goldman Sachs should be. I think any investor of any good bank would allow for the investors to know what happens with their money. Mm -hmm. And you would have competition. So if in a free banking system, if you start a bank where you say, well, sign here and I'll keep your money, but I won't tell you where any of it's going. And I say, well, I will tell you. I think I might get more customers than you coming to my bank, just because of transparency, for example. No, I'm a big fan of transparency. I'm not I think sure I understand your objection to the education of the risks there. Well, it's who's doing the educating. That's, I, I, that, that, that's, that, that's where the market comes into. Whoever does the best educating, the guests. Oh, sorry, yeah, oh, fine, yeah. fine, yeah, no, if, if you know, um, <laughs> Peston on the BBC says one thing and someone on Bloomberg says another about what these people are doing, and that's, that's perfectly fine. So I thought, I thought your, your point initially was that there would be a ordained uh, educator of by the government. Sorry, no, that's, no, I'm perfectly fine for a competition of people. I do think the government should have a role in that because yeah. they are trusted. I mean, to, to, they, they, they are, sorry, they are, <laughs> they are, they are, sorry, I mean, they are accountable more because uh, the person, yeah, this is, the different know. ways of, that you can sort of hold people to account. One is through the fact that we are going to pay their wages back. So if, if you start lying to us, you're not going to get in next day. Good. You pay the bank's happen. wages as well. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's about the social enterprise and media. Mm. Well, Changing the subject sort of subtly, but staying with the education mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about uh, digital rights as far as uh, um, spreading uh, sort of uh, so social uh, relationships and uh, social communities that you, such as those you talked about? Yeah, um, I think. This is another big libertarian rift, I think, so, so it's sort of intellectual property and rights and that sort of thing. Um, 
And most libertarians that I know don't believe in intellectual property, in that you should be able to steal someone's idea and publish it as your own. And that, yeah. um, well, not as bluntly as that. But um, so no, I, I think I'm. It's not a topic I've thought of a huge. But I, I'm broadly sympathetic to loosening the uh, patent laws and rights laws surrounding these sort of things. Yeah, I think yeah, intellectual property is a bit of a dodgy idea. It's funny because my dad's a professor and put food on the table, don't you? Um, <laughs> but no, I think as a sort of concept, I think the more freedom that people have, um, and I think actual social conventions get rid of this. So, you know, there are professions like stand up comedians or musicians where if you copy somebody, I mean, your reputation is dust, essentially. Um, so I think if you could steal um, any piece of intellectual property, it could ever be proven that it was just a copy and paste job. I mean, you would. There's an incentive for you not to do that because you would never get back into that profession. Right? You just um, there, there's you know the streets of Hollywood are lined with you know stand-up comics who have made this mistake of doing this. Yeah, no. So it'd be a great way to do social enterprise if we lose the amount of digital rights. Yeah. And do you think this, <coughs> do you think the uh, sort of broad trends are in the right direction or the wrong direction on that? Um, in which country? Um, in, well, in the great UK. To start with. Um, probably in the wrong, as a guess. I, I don't know much about the legislation, but like, I, I, most things the government does are wrong, so I'm taking it. Like, <laughs> statistically likely not to be in the right direction, yeah. Um, can't say for sure, but no, I, I think um, there's a lot of uh, worry. So think, I, I might be alluding to things like legislation to crack down on the piracy of music and films, and the government can start strangling your bandwidth if you do. Yeah, no, I'm against that sort of stuff. Uh, just because I think the music industry and the film industry are adapting to this. Um, and they have an incentive to remain paid. And <laughs> it's not up to them. They're, they're, they're smart people, they'll figure this out. And you know, I don't think you know, Brad Pitt is crying at home. I mean, the people are going to still, um, they're, they'll figure this out, the industries will do it. Um, and I, you find this a lot, I think, in the music industry now that people are getting a lot more, or more revenue from doing tours and gigs and that sort of thing than actually selling the record. Um, and films are doing a lot more merchandising nowadays, especially with these, um, like the children uh, Pixar films, they're doing it much more heavily advertising for you know, gimmicks and toys and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I think if that's what you're talking about, that's in piracy of uh, the rights to music and film, then no, I'm against what, what I think has been proposed, which is the government might be able to strangle bandwidth to stop you doing that. Which I think is also unfair to the parent who has to deal with you know really slow Gmail because they're teenager is downloading God knows how many films a day. Like, I think that's unfair. Like, you have an external uh, negative consequence to that. What do you think about the government's backing, was it 30 billion in loans to small business? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm against this. Well, it's, it's the, the government's backing loans from uh, pension funds, I think is, what, you're talking about the autumn statement proposal, yeah. I guess. Yeah, no, I'm against that. I'm also against what the money's going to be spent on, which is, yeah, no, I, it's very, it's very hard for me to find a proposition of the government will increase spending on X or will spend money on X and for me to agree with it, I find it very, yeah. So how would you, like, stimulate growth in this case? I, uh, well, I slash the amount of regulations to businesses, I'd lower taxes, I'd make it easier to hire and fire people, I'd, uh, you know, deregulate the financial services as much as we can, I would, yeah, that's what I would do. I get the, I, you know, tell the chancellor to just take a, you know, take a long, long vacation. You know, I just stop doing. <laughs> I just, you know, please, just, you know. Um, I mean, well, what he could do is spend two days, you know, trying to get as much policy through that would um, deregulate the markets as much as possible. And um, I think uh, for young people, abolishing the minimum wage would be a very good way of getting growth going. Um, I think that'd be a perfect thing to do. Um, just because I think a lot of uh, under 25s who are in need of skills are, cannot be employed by people that could give them the skills. And a lot of them live at home, so their big, um, their pull on rent or whatever is much less but that, urgent. Then you get into issues of like welfare and what's the lowest cost one can survive on. So, I mean, well, yeah, but um, this is, uh, I mean, ideally you wouldn't have a minimum wage just because there would always be. Um, well, for example, oh, sorry, I, I know I'm, I'm not ignoring the question, I'm just trying to backtrack for a bit. Um, I think it's something like uh, over 90% of British, British businesses employ less than 10 people, right? 
And it's a huge burden on uh, these businesses to employ people, and that's either because of A, regulation, or B, um, you know, the amount of wage that are mandated by the government to pay them. I don't think that uh, if you abolished the minimum wage overnight, you'd have businesses saying, right, well, it's a pound an hour. Because there's no incentive for this. Um, so, for example, there's this huge controversy. I know Nick Clegg's been banging on about this, about um, interns, for example. Um, so, I mean, in any industry, there are, there are interns, and particularly in politics and think tanks and these sort of things. Um, and primarily, they're only open, and this is, again, back to the equality thing, they're only really open to people who are wealthy enough to be able to work for either nothing or, I mean, next to nothing, right? Uh, and I don't think that's a great way to do it, because it, is, you, it does become a bit of a club that you have the, the wealthier um, doing it. And I think actually if, if you know, uh, places were able to offer you know, a bit lower than minimum wage, you'd be fine. And you would get less, especially in, in certain trades, for example, where you need to have skills. It's not, they are not worth, e.g., economically, six pounds, eight an hour, is that the minimum wage, I think? Right? I think, so it's about six quid an hour, yeah. Yeah. six pounds, eight pence an hour. Yeah. Because, I mean, we have, what, over a million unemployed young people in this country? And I can't see the minimum wage helping that. But I, I can only see that as a barrier to getting people employed. What about the yeah. end of universal basic income? So everyone Don't gets, know what that means. Everyone sort of gets a grant. Just to oh, yeah, I, I'd, be for, I'd be for that if there was also the abolition of welfare, for example. Like, yeah. this is what Milton Friedman said, you have a negative income tax. Which is, you know, not very libertarian, but that you would have, there would be essentially that, so you don't get any right. housing benefit, job seeker allowance, or yeah. child amount, you know, benefits, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you would have, I mean, it would depend on the country, but you would have a basic amount where you're guaranteed not to starve, and you will not That's die of exposure, but it's, yeah. you know, uh, but there will still be an incentive to get a job, essentially. <laughs> that the government, uh, and it also is a good policy in that it also instills personal responsibility. That you know you couldn't get a check from the government at the beginning of the month and then spend it all on drinking and after the government the government said well okay it's your money and it's up to you to yeah. remove resentment as well sorry remove resentment it would yeah and I think it, it seriously would yeah because I, I think um, the way that Friedman um, argued it is that it would always be it would always just pay more to work for example um, which unfortunately in, I know the current government's trying to reform this but uh, there are a few situations where people are better off dolling it. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think especially on the sort of right wing, um, that there's a lot of uh, personal animosity to people on the dole, for example. But, you know, I think they're making a perfectly rational economic choice. So it's, there's no reason why for an extra 90 pence an hour for 40 hours work that it's worth, if you could stay at home and lead a life of leisure not working and you get, you know, transfer to your bank balance, or you could go out and work, but you're only working for an extra, sometimes, 50 pence an hour, what, I think it's perfectly rational, if not. Then you're paying for travel and other such things, and it turns out you're actually losing money, so, yeah, perfectly reasonable thing not to go work, but... Well, I know I'm taking topic, topic. This, this, yeah, um, sorry. But, uh, you said about the regulation of the financial services was thing that grew. Yeah. Um, the way that I sort of conceptualized it is that they earn profits by taking market share from like so there's, a, there's probably like a limited number of a limited amount of consumer demand really in terms of I mean I, yes, sure. it, but, so I mean how would the regulation if, if you're always gonna if it's always competitive mm -hmm. then that's sort of it inegalitarian isn't it? I mean maybe <laughs> I thought we were started from the first question on egalitarianism which I don't give a huge amount of green, but I think, um, because it seems to me that like actually the UK is really good at financial services, globally compared, there's actually something, like especially in the last few decades, like we seem to have developed a bit of a talent for it, uh, and it's a huge source of, you know... Is that, is that a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing, because it, it provides a huge amount, well, it provides jobs, a huge number of jobs, and a huge number amount of government revenue, which, uh, yeah, if, I think... If they're, if they're keeping in... If their, if, their, if their demand is contingent upon people's lack of education and... But it's not. I, don't, I just don't accept this idea that, you know, the financial services are an industry that exploit people's ignorance. I just don't... You can say, I mean, I've heard some arguments against financial services. It's not an exploitation, because 
because it's not. Or a, taking advantage of. Uh, but it's, it's not an immoral act because it, I'm, I'm not condemning them. I mean, it's a fact, but I'm not condemning. Them. Yeah, but it's not. It's not unique to financial services. Mm. But it's still. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's efficiency. If, it's still an inefficiency. Yeah. So I will never know as much as I would like to about all products I buy. That's a fact. Fine. Um, but it's not just unique to financial services. Um, I don't know why we're singling out financial services here. I mean, when when I bought, you know. I mean, well, these IEA books could potentially, you know, like, I don't know actually who publishes them or what they do, you know, or my, my clothes, I don't know every detail I'd like about the product or manufacturer of them or who they employ and what they pay them, you know, my watch, I mean, you could, and my bank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, lot, a lot of these other industries have sort of tried to do, like, checks on, I mean, kind of a lot of clothes industries have been a lot. Yeah, but I trust banks to regulate themselves more than the government would do, yeah. I, I think the banks should check themselves. Much more than, yeah. That's my own call on it. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Does anyone else have questions? No? No? Well, yeah. I'll stick around. It's up to anyone. Sure.